Hello and welcome or welcome back to the channel. This is the beautiful Peterborough Cathedral, home to a very famous Queen. She was somebody who was at the centre of one of England's most turbulent periods in history, Catherine of Aragon. Catherine, of course, was the first and longest serving wife of Henry VIII. They married on the 11th of June 1509 and their marriage was annulled on the 23rd of May 1533. This video will concentrate on Catherine's final days up until her death and will look at a couple of alternative paths European history could have taken if Catherine's choices had been different to those she actually made at the time. Catherine of Aragon was born on the 16th of December 1485 to Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabella I of Castile. Prince Arthur, the heir apparent to the English throne, and Catherine were engaged at the ages of two and three respectively. In 1501 they were married, but Arthur passed away from illness five months later. Catherine had later claimed that she had remained a virgin even though they had shared the same bed. Catherine then became the first known female ambassador in the history of Europe. She served as the Aragonese Crown's ambassador to England in 1507 during her protracted period of uncertainty. This was due to her status as a widow. In 1509 she wed Arthur's brother Henry VIII, King of England, the recently crowned monarch. She presided as England's regent for six months in 1513 when Henry VIII was away in France. The Battle of Flodden took place during this period and Catherine played a significant role by delivering an emotive speech about English bravery and patriotism. The English then crushed and routed a Scottish invasion. By 1525, Henry VIII had developed an obsession though with someone else, Anne Boleyn. He was unsatisfied with the lack of surviving sons from his marriage to Catherine, leaving his daughter Mary as their heir presumptive despite the lack of historical precedence for a woman to hold the throne at the time. He requested that the Pope annul the marriage. Pope Clement VII of course refused, which launched a series of events that resulted in the split between England and the Catholic Church. Henry then claimed control over the Church of England and all its ecclesiastical matters. Following the invalidation of their union in 1533, Henry married Anne with the approval of the English clergy. Many people sympathised with Catherine since she refused to recognise Henry as the head of the church in England and believed she was the king's legitimate wife and queen. In spite of this, Henry merely recognised her as the Dowager Princess of Wales, a nod of course to his late brother. Henry banished Catherine from court and she was finally sent to Kimbleton Castle in April 1534. This is where she was to spend the rest of her life. Kimbleton Castle was originally a medieval castle but underwent extensive rebuilding to convert it into a stately palace long after Catherine's death. Catherine's ally and legal counsellor was the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V's imperial ambassador to England, Eustace Shapwee. Shapwee had an extensive legal background and he used this to great effect in defending Catherine's interests. In the end, Shapwee's attempts to thwart English plots against Catherine were unsuccessful and Henry wed Anne Boleyn. Shapwee is said to have hated Anne and had never been able to bring himself to call her by her name, only referring to her as the whore or concubine. Catherine's health began to deteriorate in December 1535. Some accounts state that this was after she drank some beer. Now, nobody is certain when or how Catherine developed a taste for Welsh beer. Henry's grandmother had advised her to start getting used to drinking wine before she left Spain nearly four decades prior because she insisted English water was unfit for human consumption. She may have chosen beer instead of the young wines at Kimbleton because apparently they repulsed her. She drank a draught of Welsh beer during her protracted illness for whatever cause and immediately began to feel much worse. Shapui speculated later that it might have contained a slow-acting poison 
but that is now thought extremely unlikely. The sickness was initially thought not to be an issue. At first, Thomas Cromwell informed Shapwe that she was very ill, but this appears to have been a wishful assumption on Cromwell's part. Shapwe, who was getting ready to leave for Kimbleton out of concern for Catherine, was advised not to worry by the doctor, who said that she was getting better and the doctor promised to inform Shapwe if things deteriorated. On December the 13th, Shapwe reported, She has recovered and is now well. She was, in fact, feeling well enough that day to write letters of last resort to her nephew, Charles V, and Dr Ortiz, her devoted admirer in Rome. The latter was forewarned that if the Pope did not take immediate action against Henry, he would be turning England over to the devil who, until now, is half-tied. She passed the letter addressed to Charles V to Shapwe. The letter asked Charles to protect her daughter Mary. She then begged Shapwe to add words that would move a stone to compassion. But the ambassador acknowledged that his repertoire was completely depleted. If nobody was listening right now, it wasn't for want of effort on his part. Meanwhile, Anne Boleyn was expecting a child once more. There was little reason, as of yet, to believe that Henry would soon stop speaking to his second wife or that Jane Seymour, one of Catherine's former maids of honour, would catch his attention and, in part because of the guidance of Catherine's former friends, successfully play Anne's own game by insisting on marriage and nothing else. It's unlikely that Catherine could have foreseen that Anne would succumb to the executioner's sword in less than six months. Catherine's doctor sent Shapui an urgent message on December the 29th. He ought to get approval right away to travel to Kimbleton in light of Catherine's alarming relapse. The next day, Henry welcomed him in Greenwich. There, he rode his jousting horses. Henry's spirits were high at the time, but little did he know that he would have a serious fall here a few weeks later. He put his arm around Shapui's neck led him to his quarters and started to discuss politics. He said with apparent relief that Catherine wouldn't live long. That would open the door for an agreement with the Emperor Charles V. News that Catherine was actually now very seriously ill arrived, which seemed to support Henry's optimism. This time, Shapui left towards Kimbleton, but it took him three days to arrive since he was still unsure of how bad the situation was. During that time, he put together a sizeable group of companions. Stephen Vaughan, a servant of Cromwell, was sent to watch Shapui. He would not let Catherine escape his exhaustive scrutiny, not even on her deathbed. Meanwhile, Mary begged Henry to let her visit her mother's bedside, but Henry declined. A surprising visitor arrived at Kimbleton Castle before Shapui's party. The gates were open to a flustered-looking lady early on New Year's Eve 1536. The woman appeared to be in need of shelter after falling from her horse less than a mile away. She said that she needed a place to stay until she recovered. Maria de Salinas, also known as Lady Willoughby, was devoted to Catherine. She had hurriedly travelled from her London home to be at Catherine's side. Salinas thought never to see the princess again, when she first heard of Catherine's illness, the news of which had spread quickly. Together, they had endured the harrowing sea voyage to England many years previously when they were young girls. Over the years, Salinas proved to be Catherine's most trustworthy and devoted friend. Twenty years before, Catherine had once stated, In all my suffering, she is the only one who gives me consolation. Selinus was now adamant that she would return to be by her mistress's side for her final moments. She put on a sophisticated ruse to get inside the house past the guards, saying a letter authorising her entry was on the way and pleading with them not to turn away a woman who had been thrown from her horse on a chilly winter night. The men in charge of the household did not have a response. Selinus rushed to Catherine's room and slammed the door in their faces. Selinus discovered Catherine to be seriously ill. Catherine had just turned 50 years old. She was unable to stand and could hardly sit up. She had struggled to swallow or hold Mills down for several days. 
Over the preceding six nights, the ache in her stomach had kept her from falling asleep. Although she was still awake, she told Shapwi that their first meeting should take place in front of witnesses after he had arrived the following day. She didn't want Henry to become suspicious that they were making plots against him. Stephen Vaughan was welcomed inside together with senior officers of the house. It's easy to imagine them being shocked as Catherine had kept her word and declined to interact with the officials who referred to her as the Princess Dowager. For more than a year they had not seen the woman whose home they were managing. Despite not seeing each other much, Catherine and Shapwee had a close bond that had been developed through her difficulties. However, they were both too worldly to let their feelings take over while the king's men were present. Even in such dire circumstances, they knew how to respect the formalities of Catherine's first official visitor reception in a number of years. There was bowing, hand-kissing and formal greeting language. Beforehand, they had agreed on the list of items that had been uttered in order for Henry to hear them later. Clearly and slowly enough for anyone listening to understand. Vaughan interpreted for himself and took mental notes as the officers watched in confusion. Shapwee's presence was acknowledged by Catherine. In the aftermath, he recalled that she had expressed relief at being able to pass away in his arms rather than vanish like a beast. She was persuaded by Shapwee to hold on to her life. It was crucial for maintaining Christendom's peace, he claimed. She called Shapwee again at five that afternoon but this time there were no witnesses. The discussions went on for two hours. Shapui later stated that he tried numerous times to get up and leave the room as he was afraid he would exhaust her. She refused to hear of it. The officers were concerned because they were unaware of what was being discussed. Neither did the dependable elderly women who cleaned her chamber as neither of them spoke Spanish. They were his only source of information regarding what took place in the enigmatic room where Catherine had vanished to. Every day for four days, Shapwee spent two hours in Catherine's rooms. Mary's struggles were causing her concern. Once more, Catherine bemoaned the Emperor and Pope's inaction. To allay the fears of a sick woman, Shapwee distorted the facts by asserting that the Pope was now so incensed by Henry's actions that he was prepared to act against him. Most likely, Catherine's shrewd thinking was not duped. Instead, she acknowledged that she was worried by the idea that she might be to blame for England's troubles, or at least the heresies and scandals that were allowed to enter during the divorce proceedings. Had her determination to stand up to her husband caused her chosen nation to drift away from Rome and caused the needless deaths of honourable men? It was an awkward question. Even while Henry's underlying selfishness was ultimately to blame, the truthful response was that it had. But Shapwiz reassured her. She may have had doubts and scruples, but there was nothing else she could have done, he claimed. Perhaps Catherine placed her hopes for the future in her daughter after realising that her life's goal of uniting England and Spain was in tatters. His visits and Maria de Salinas' tender care helped to lift her spirits and enhance her health. Catherine started to eat and keep her food down, which was a good sign. They then decided that Shapui should depart after the fourth day because she was doing so much better. Otherwise, Henry may believe that he was using his permission improperly to visit a woman who was supposedly on her deathbed. She wanted to occupy herself with one of my people who entertained her, he added adding that he had seen her laugh two or three times that evening. She had a restful night and Shapui departed gradually the next morning. If something went wrong, the doctor promised to send a rider to find him. But nobody showed up, so he continued on his way back to London. Over the following two days, Catherine's condition improved. On January the 6th, she dressed her hair and sat up. However, she started to fidget that evening. She began inquiring about the time shortly after midnight. She wished to receive communion, but was concerned that she might not make it until morning. The stressed old Spanish bishop, Jorge de Atheca, who served as her confessor, offered to defy the regulations and administer communion to her right away. 
He believed the situation to be extreme enough to justify it. A little group of devoted servants began to feel an increasing feeling of anxiety. Catherine held off until daybreak. She received communion, but Atheka forgot he had promised Shapwi that he would get her to make a vow on her deathbed to settle the question once and for all of whether she had been a virgin while married to Arthur. Catherine, on the other hand, was busy with more useful tasks. She was aware that she was dying and didn't expect to see the day through. She wrote a letter to Henry requesting what she wanted done with her possessions and stating that she wanted to be buried at a chapel run by the observant friars who she revered. A few years after her passing, Roman Catholic writers started to share the text of a letter she allegedly dictated to her husband while she was dying. This is most probably fiction. The letter continued to state her love for Henry and that she forgave him for the troubles that she believed he had bestowed upon her. She also asked that he take care of their daughter, Mary. Catherine started to pray. She pleaded with God to put Henry back on the right road and absolve him of his wrongdoing. For her own soul, she begged forgiveness. Death was now plainly near. She still whispered little prayers to herself. She found her only solace in them. She eventually breathed her last just before two o'clock on the afternoon of January the 7th, 1536. The Spanish Queen of Henry died questioning herself as to whether she had done the right thing by a nation that had ultimately treated her poorly. Many people believe there had been criminal activity. In fact, her death was most likely caused by cancer. All of the internal organs were found to be healthy and normal except for the heart. The embalmer tasked with handling her corpse discovered the heart was quite black. The heart was cut in two and repeatedly cleansed, but it remained dark in colour. The embalmer, who was actually a chandler with speciality in wax, also discovered that the heart consisted of a growth to one side. This was most certainly a subsequent melanotic sarcoma. Her death elicited a range of responses. Chapuy, who was furious, said that Henry went dancing with Anne Boleyn's ladies while wearing yellow clothing and a white feather in his cap. His joy was fuelled by his conviction that England was no longer threatened by war. According to Chapuy, the general consensus was considerably different. However, the quick, violent insurrection against Henry that Chapuy would have liked to have seen happen never materialised, despite the anguish and rage that her death elicited in many people. Catherine's passing did not heal any wounds. It merely served to reinforce the conclusion of the terrible first act of the Reformation drama that was playing out in England. Despite her daughter Mary's later attempts to avert it, the bloody split from Rome she had predicted proved to be inevitable. Only more people would die, but few could possibly have imagined that Anne Boleyn would be the most famous head to roll, or that it would happen so swiftly. On January the 29th at Peterborough Abbey, Catherine was buried. Coincidentally, that same day, Anne miscarried. The greatest lesson to be drawn from Catherine's personal downfall was that Henry's greatest passion was in fact producing a male successor. The fact that Anne had failed counted against her hugely. Ironically, Catherine's passing also relieved Henry of what he perceived to be Anne's yoke around his neck. After completing the difficult effort of pursuing Anne Boleyn and undergoing the enormous task of divorcing Catherine, Anne's sharp, fiery personality that had once been so alluring and enticing to Henry quickly became intolerable. The numerous foes of Anne moved swiftly, placing a young Jane Seymour in front of Henry's eyes while urging him to view Anne as treasonous. It was then easy for Cromwell to handle the rest, remaining as ice cool and effective as he always was. Treason and adultery accusations then sealed Anne's demise. She died in the manner that Catherine had feared for herself. Her head was severed with a sword on a gallows at Tower Green on May the 19th, 1536, by an executioner who had been specially sent for from Calais. 
Catherine was outlived by barely 19 weeks by Henry's second queen. Henry and Jane Seymour became betrothed the day following Anne's execution. After 10 days, they were married. 17 months later, the future Edward VI, the king's son and heir, was born. After giving birth, Jane Seymour passed away a short time later. As Henry's queen, Catherine of Aragon had lasted more than twice as long as Henry's other five wives put together. Catherine's daughter, Mary, proved to be her most important legacy. After making peace with her father, Mary eventually received the crown that was rightfully and unmistakably hers. Mary was technically the first Queen Regnant of England. That Henry was attempting to prevent this when he divorced Catherine is now seen as incredibly ironic. Catherine was buried in Peterborough Abbey, which later evolved into a cathedral. Naturally, the funeral service was for a dowager princess rather than a queen. Let's pause for a moment while we take a look around this fantastic cathedral. Mary Queen of Scots, another tragic monarch, was also buried here later in the century. However, King James I, Mary's son, moved her remains to Westminster Abbey in 1612. The twin issues of whether Catherine was genuinely a virgin when she married Henry and also whether England would have remained a Roman Catholic country had she quietly entered a convent continue to dominate discussions about Catherine's place in history. In his writing, Chapuy reminded us of another decision Catherine had to make. Catherine had the option of instigating war against England and her nephew Charles V's powerful empire in order to regain her marriage rights, but she chose peace. Although Charles may not have wanted to go to war, Chapuy seems to believe that he would have been persuaded to if Catherine encouraged her English allies to rise up and rebel against Henry. We can only imagine the carnage averted by her choice and the drastically different path that Europe's history could have taken had Catherine chosen the path of war. Well, on that note, I would like to thank you for watching this video and hit the like button if you found it enlightening and please consider subscribing if you would like to see more content such as this. Once again, thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye for now.